Welcome everyone to this, the uh, 74th seminar of the Global Health Histories series. Um, again, we have uh, two. Uh, we have two speakers uh, on the topic of global health communication. Um, we also have uh, today um, a couple of other announcements to make. One is that uh, um, the, the department that we collaborate with. Uh, at the University of York, the Center for Global Health Histories has just been designated um, a WHO collaborating center. So we're very pleased about that. And for those who are present here, there is a cake in the other room, so you're uh, welcome to participate in the celebration of that event. Um, the second innovation uh, today is that we'll be taking questions on Twitter. So anybody who wants to send in uh, questions about Twitter, um, we will also be, uh, uh, if, if anyone's a follower of WHO, the 500,000 people know. <laughs> yeah, the WHO Twitter account. Yeah. Two million is already, really well. There you go. Um, 500,000. Um, okay, so um, the first speaker um, for, for today is uh, Dipsy uh, Wickram Masinga who is from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, Dipsy, is, uh, her background is in politics, philosophy, and history. That's what she's studied as her first degree. But she's been working in the communications field um, for 20 years. Uh, she's uh, worked with Reuters, uh, the National Health Service, and various uh, NGOs. Um, currently, she, as I said, she's at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, we welcome her um, to give her presentation first. Thank you. So good afternoon everybody and before I start I'd just like to thank Sanjoy and Human for inviting me to speak to you all. Um, the project that I'm working on at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is a research project funded by the Gates Foundation and we are evaluating innovations in maternal and newborn health to improve maternal and newborn survival in northeast Nigeria. Ethiopia and Uttar Pradesh in India and the project's called Ideas which is roughly informed decisions for actions in maternal and newborn health. Okay so I will give you a short introduction and then talk a little bit about transitions in history and theory of health communication um, but the bulk of my talk will be about practice um, with some examples from my own experience and also from things I'm, I've observed. Okay, So I expect you all have a definition for health communication but this is the definition that has formed my understanding that health communication is a process for participation that is based on dialogue where there's an interactive exchange of information, ideas, techniques and knowledge among key actors, leading to improved understanding, shared knowledge, greater consensus mm. and identification of possible effective action. And HealthLink Worldwide, some of you may be familiar with as RTAG, which was its former name, it was an international NGO and for over 30 years focused on health communication techniques. Sadly, it no longer exists. Um, but this definition strongly undermined all of HealthLink's work, uh, despite the uh, 2010 publication date. It was around a lot longer than that. So contrast that idea of health communication as a collaborative process with what Hippocrates wrote 2,500 years ago. Some patients, though conscious that their condition is perilous, recover their health simply through their contentment 
with the goodness of the physician. Underlying this comment is the idea of a one directional flow of communication from the powerful physician to the passive patient. And it's not just in Europe that there's this perception of doctor knows best. Ratson, Payne and Bishop suggest that this is a global phenomenon. The intimate connection between communication and good health permeates humankind's multicultural history. Hippocrates aside, the documented practice of health communication is relatively recent, only becoming widespread in the 20th century, when there's a shift away from concerns about sanitation that had held so much sway in the 19th century, towards the concept of social hygiene, and a focus on what the individual could do to prevent infection and disease. This public health poster from the UK is a good example. But it's still this model of telling people what to do and expecting them to do it for their, because it's for their own good. And that idea is still prevalent, even though research has shown that it's unlikely to produce the desired effects. As you might expect, early health communication theories were based on communication as one-way transmission of information and the study of persuasion. Collective behaviours were seen as the sum of individuals' behaviours, and no distinction was made between interpersonal communication and mass communication. They were seen as just a larger version of the same thing, which is not necessarily the case. So this, despite, the, despite being socio-culturally specific, this poster with its local language and illustrations of local staple foods is still about telling mothers what to do. It says, feed your child with these kinds of foods from the age of one year old. However, things are changing. Health communication is now considered by many to be a vital part of all aspects of health. That includes research, clinical practice, health education, public health, global health, and policy making. And although the role of health communication professionals in facilitating collaborations is important, it's not always acknowledged by experts and their audiences. After all, we can all communicate, can't we? But there's a bit more to it than that. Over time, health communication theories have evolved, borrowing much from social and behavioural sciences. Social and psychological theories have stressed the need to adopt multiple levels of analysis to address the influence of social and policy factors in health behaviours. And such theories and models help to guide health communication away from a one-way flow model. It's worth remembering too that health communication doesn't happen in isolation. Various social determinants of health may be relevant, as well as cultural factors, and these may bring opportunities for cross-sectoral collaboration on health communication. So moving on to the practice. When it comes to the practice of health communication, right from the beginning of a project, it helps to have, develop a communication strategy. And this guides the process and ensures that there's participatory planning from anybody who might need to be involved. And that goes from the planning stage through delivery, distribution, and beyond that to evaluation. So to figure out, to help sort out this communication strategy, it's good to figure out the answers to various questions, seven in all. Who? Why? What? How? When? Where? 
and what's happening. And I'd like to briefly consider each of these in turn. So who's the health communication for? It's really important to understand your audience or audiences. There might be a secondary audience as well. And there might be a variety of audiences. And you need to plan your work with them so that you can tailor the health communication to meet their particular needs. It's useful to find out all sorts of information about them, the age range, gender, education, literacy levels, the language of your audience, and how they describe what, they, what language they use to describe health conditions. Other factors might be the level of ownership or access to radio and television and mobile phones, any technology. Their familiarity with different media, including local and traditional media, and from where they usually get their health information. You might also want to find out about what they know or believe to be a particular issue in health, accessing health services and why they think there's a problem there. Also, whether they're open to new ideas, where they meet, where they gather together, and what or who influences them to take action or change their behaviours and practices. The second question is why? Why is this health communication needed? There's all sorts, there's a variety of different things it might be needed for. It might be just conveying simple facts, or it could be sharing complex information like um, research findings or something like that. It could be um, teaching, teaching problem solving skills or training in practical skills, encouraging community dialogue, facilitating individual or social change, or advocating for policy change. All these are relevant and they all need to be considered and will have a different different tailoring of your communication. But looking at both who and why for a minute, I'd like to show you this. This is from Chetna, the Centre for Health Education, Training and Nutrition Awareness in Ahmedabad in India. And Chetna do a lot of work around with young people, teaching them about sexual and reproductive health. And they've developed these aprons and they ask for volunteers to wear the aprons and each apron has a flap, has, has a series of flaps actually. One is, shows the female reproductive system and one shows the male reproductive system and the female one has the menstrual cycle on it and the male one uh, explains non-surgical vasectomy and condom use. So this is one image of communication, one idea about health communication. So to go back to our seven questions, the third question is what? What content needs to be included? It's become a bit of a cliche, but it really is true that less is more. If you try to cram in too many messages, it just confuses things and people can't take it all in. So it's much better to plan a series of different communication outputs. Then comes how, what communications or how, how will it be conveyed? What are the channels that you will use or the media that will be most effective? And it might be again, that you need to use a variety of different media and communication channels. It's very easy sitting here in Europe to think that the internet's the ideal solution, but it's just worth remembering that only one third of the world's population has access to the internet as a, as a useful technology for health communication. So even in developed countries, there's still a considerable percentage that don't have access to the internet. And this is often likely to be vulnerable communities who are also the people 
for whom it's difficult to access health services. So it is worth bearing in mind wherever you're communicating. But other technologies might be more successful in, in low resource settings. And this is an example of an innovation that Ideas is evaluating in Uttar Pradesh in India. It's called MSAKI, and it's a mobile phone app that provides frontline health workers, called ushers or accredited social health activists, with 153 key health messages on prenatal care and delivery, postpartum mother and newborn care, immunization, postpartum family planning, and nutrition. And MSLATI uses a con combination of text messages, audio, and illustrations. And the messages are made relevant to the specific context in Uttar Pradesh through, being, through having localized illustrations and dialects as well. So the fifth question to ask ourselves is when? Are there any key dates or windows of opportunity to be considered? Sometimes it helps to link health messages with a specific date. I'm currently coordinating the production of a knowledge summary for the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, which gives a brief synthesis of recent scientific evidence about newborn health and survival, including premature newborns. And that will be launched on World Prematurity Day later this month, the 18th of November. But equally, a health communication output might relate to a community event, like this poster of an open evening about childhood by blindness in Bangladesh. Or it might be that government officials need health information ahead of a policy meeting. In the IDEAS team, we have three locally based country coordinators, one each in Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Uttar Pradesh. And they work closely with the government. They've developed good relationships with government officials. And they try to ensure that health information is available when the, these officials need it and that it's been produced in a timely fashion and an accessible format. And the sixth question is where will the communication be used? After all, what works in northeastern Nigeria won't necessarily be appropriate for Ethiopia or Uttar Pradesh or anywhere else. In the foreground of this image, there's a health booklet from Ethiopia, which is used to communicate health messages in Amharic and through the illustrations, which are also context specific. But even within Ethiopia, communication developed in one region may need to be translated into a different language before it can be used in another region. Adaptations may also need to be considered for delivering health messages to different types of audiences each of whom have their own focus. For example, communication about HIV-related TB needs to be tailored differently for policymakers, for frontline health workers, and for village elders. And this is an illustration of a community meeting in Gombe State in northeast Nigeria. And then when it comes to clinical information, well, that's, again, a complicated process. After all, you've got other things to consider too. An appropriate health communication that was appropriate last year may not be appropriate for this year. It may need to be updated and it will probably need to be reviewed again before it's used next year. I used to work in a busy London hospital that had set up a knowledge and information centre to provide health information to patients in support of their clinical consultations. And one of my tasks was to undertake an annual quality audit of all the patient information leaflets that we stocked to ensure that the information we were giving out was reliable and up to date. And each leaflet had to have a publication date on it and it had to have been produced in the last three years. 
anything other than that was considered below standard and was discarded and we had to find replacement, suitable replacement or a better replacement. So we've looked at six of those questions and the final one is what's happening and that's evaluating how the health communication process has gone. It's really important to get feedback from your audience and see from them, to hear from them what's worked, what might need to be improved or changed another time. But while it's relatively easy to measure process indicators, that's the numbers of papers you've produced or posters or pamphlets or meetings held, it's also, it's, and it's also easy to measure the reach through distribution and attendance figures, what's really hard to measure is the health impact of health communication. Those effects need to be measured over time and that's not often available within the life of a three to five year health development project. Moreover, health communication research methodologies are complex and messy and they may not produce conclusive evidence. And as I mentioned before, health communication isn't done in isolation, so it's very hard to say what's the impact of health communication and what is because of other factors. But I'd like to give you one illustration, and that's, I'll tell you about an advocacy training project in Bangladesh with a, an NGO called SARPV, which stands for Social Assistance and Rehabilitation for the Physically Vulnerable. And SARPV supports people living with disabilities in Bangladesh. They did some training in communicating for advocacy and decided that they needed to raise awareness about the life of people with disabilities and the difficulties that they face on a daily basis. And they put on an exhibition called Seeing in the Dark. Various people were invited to this exhibition, including government officials, business leaders, journalists, and other professionals. And the exhibition was held in a series of rooms that had been blacked out so that visitors could experience some of the issues and hazards that people with visual impairments face every day. <clears throat> sighted visitors were guided by blind or partially sighted visitors who described life in Dhaka from their perspective they were given fake banknotes and using sound, taste, touch and smell, they had to negotiate crossing a busy road, haggle with a rickshaw driver, buy a lottery ticket, select a clean shirt to wear and go shopping in a market. In the last room where they were able to readjust back to the light, they could see how much change they had left and compare it with what they should have had and see that the shirt they had selected, although it had felt clean, actually had a large stain on it. They were also invited to leave comments about the exhibition on a graffiti wall and these were used as part of the evaluation process. It's impossible to measure the impact of the exhibition or to attribute changes directly to it, but sometime later, the Bank of Bangladesh took measures to change the size of the 100 and 500 taka notes, which had previously both been the same size and therefore only recognizable by sight. And that had an effect not only for visually impaired people, but also for older people whose sight starts to fail and things like that. So it did benefit the whole population. Other considerations when doing health communication include ensuring that resources needed are available and that's in terms of time, people and funds. And despite this increasing acknowledgement of the importance of health communication, such practical considerations are often overlooked. It just seems like people think you can do health communication on nothing and uh, it's not possible. So Andrew Chetley, who was director of Chief Executive of HealthLink, drew five key lessons on health communication. 
and what makes it more powerful. But it reaches people on an emotional level as well as a rational level. Because communication that evokes empathy and other emotions typical of interpersonal dialogue has more of an impact. But it relates to people's social or life contexts because people make and maintain life changes within the context of their family, community, and taking account of cultural factors. But it's a combination of the effectiveness of interpersonal communication and the reach of mass media communication. And Robert Hornick outlines a communication model in which mass and interpersonal media operate at individual, social and institutional levels, all of which are needed to effect change. It's also more powerful if it's tailored to the specific needs of the audience, because more closely meeting those needs results in health communication that people will really act upon. And finally, that it's interactive. So hopefully today's lunchtime seminar is engaging you on an emotional level, as well as being informative, and that you can relate to the health communication messages in both this and Christie's presentation and relate them to your own settings. The seminar is using a variety of communication techniques, oral, visual, webinar, and it's been tailored specifically for a lunchtime event. So informative, but also hopefully a bit entertaining too. And I hope that together we can make it an interactive event by having a lively discussion and sharing of knowledge. Andrew summarised these lessons as experts have messages to send, but people have lives to live. My final example is a group that's tried to incorporate all these lessons into their work, and it's a rather unusual health communication initiative from an international group of clowns. They're called Asociación Payasos, and they live and work in Guatemala. These clowns double up as health communicators, delivering health education messages. Initially, they started touring in the highlands of Guatemala, where access is difficult, where the first language of many people is one of the indigenous Mayan languages rather than the official language of the country, Spanish. And they use street theater and workshops to teach people in a culturally appropriate way about sexual and reproductive health and particularly HIV and AIDS, and how they can protect themselves. And this, the character on the right, is a personification of human immunodeficiency virus. So it's the HIV himself, the giant. <coughs> Together with beneficiary communities, the Asociación Payasos has also developed HIV print-based materials to deliver essential messages to low literacy populations in indigenous languages. <clears throat> and it trains young people from local communities, both as clowns and health educators. They've now got four field terms, teams and 40 young educators working across Guatemala and three associated pilot projects within, working with indigenous communities in Mexico, Nicaragua and on Honduras. So, I realise that most of my examples have been from working at a community level, but I just don't think that images of government officials sitting around a table are very memorable, nor are they easy to come by, or to get permission to use. And health communication to get research into practice, well, that's not really photogenic either. But the basic principles remain the same, whoever you're working with, who, why, what, how, when, where, and what's happening. So thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, Dipti, for that um, very interesting presentation. Um, we're already getting Twitter questions coming in, so we'll hold the questions while we hear from the second speaker. So I'm happy to introduce uh, the Director of Communications at WHO, 
uh, Christine Sieg, who um, has a, also a background as a journalist. Uh, she worked at CNN and also at the American Red Cross before coming to WHO. So I'll ask her to give the WHO perspective. <clears throat> Thank you, Herman. I tell you, if we were pressed for time, I could just put my name on Deepthi's presentation. Uh, a lot of the uh, approaches that we look for uh, are very similar. Uh, what I will do for the first two slides uh, is just take a moment for the people who are on the web uh, and give them just two slides very quickly on what WHO's role is, what our main functions are, because that will be the foundation for the rest of our conversation. Uh, so if, if uh, those of you in the room can just uh, bear with that for just a moment, I know you know what we do, uh, but I think it's important for the conversation that will come after this. Uh, so. We basically start with just looking at WHO's core functions. Uh, now, WHO is a specialized UN agency uh, that is there to advise the member states on health issues. Uh, and it is because we are trusted to produce uh, accurate, impartial health information and health evidence uh, that people actually listen to us and take our health information and take it forward. What we do will be a bit upstream uh, from where Deepthi was uh, in her presentation. Uh, you're familiar with our norms and standards and guidelines, and, and really the idea there is to get uh, a standard approach globally uh, for health issues uh, so that people are approaching uh, treating disease uh, in the same way. If it's uh, diagnosing uh, HIV and starting antiretroviral therapy when the CD4 count hits 500, it's getting that consistency uh, across the world. It's, it's the idea uh, that we've got uh, growth standards so you know how fast uh, your children should be growing uh, and, and that you know if, if the water in front of you is even safe to drink. Uh, this is a consistency that we are tasked with as an organization. Obviously, we uh, work on research and, and we look for places uh, where we need more research and where the evidence uh, needs to be bolstered. We take the evidence when it's solid and frame policy options uh, for countries to work to uh, improve people's health in their communities. Uh, and again, this goes to what Deep Two was talking about. Uh, we provide uh, technical support to countries whether it's expertise, hands on deck, uh, to do what they don't necessarily have the national capacity to do. And we work with national and regional agencies to monitor and assess global health trends, to call attention to what needs to be paid attention to uh, when you're addressing health issues. And then to tie it all together, we, we work with the countries to strengthen health systems. So that's the idea of where our communications comes from. Uh, our goal, just like the organization, is to communicate to help people live healthier lives. Uh, we do believe very strongly, uh, as Deep Sea was referring to, uh, that health information is an expertise and that by sharing information, people can take the actions that they need uh, in order to be healthier. Uh, but we do it through very different audiences. Uh, we work with policymakers to get them what they need to create uh, the policies they need uh, for their specific situation. Uh, we work with health workers uh, to give them the information they need uh, to improve people's <coughs> lives, to take the best approach in health care. The media is an incredibly powerful platform for us. Uh, I think we can all agree probably that the media has far more reach uh, far more access and far more influence than anything we could ever uh, do on our own. And again, it goes back to the customization, really using the media as a tool to reach the audiences that you're trying to reach, uh, making sure that you're reaching out not just as a one-size-fits-all uh, blanket approach, uh, but recognizing that different groups of people listen, read, and watch different things. Uh, and we need to target our messages to be something that will be carried to the people we are trying to reach. <clears throat> Social media uh, is one of our most active places right now. We'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. Sorry. Gregory, can you call Shona? Thank you. Uh, 
the um, general public is an increasing, increasingly an important audience for us. Now, we saw a shift in this within the past decade. Uh, it used to be we were the technical expertise that went to other experts. Uh, but increasingly, as you have seen shifts in communications technology, you have also seen shifts and the general public coming to us and seeking more information. And that's very important for us because the way uh, we would share information with professional health workers is very different from the way that we would share it uh, with the general public. Uh, so there you see we kind of work two different prongs there, uh, sharing health information from many different audiences. One of our key partners in this is our regional offices and working to our country offices. Because as DT mentioned, it does have to be customized for individual people in individual places because everybody has different core values that will inspire them to take up uh, certain messages and certain actions. And it's important that we connect into that. And because we have the regions who really are the experts in what works in their region, uh, it works well that we team up with our regional communications officers. Uh, then, of course, protecting the organization's reputation. This may sound like something that's not important to uh, a health organization, but it's everything for us. Uh, because the reason that people do take our health information is because they trust us, because they believe us, because they know that the information and the research and the evidence that we put together is solid. It is not influenced unduly uh, by somebody it shouldn't be uh, influenced by. Uh, that it is exactly the best uh, information that is out there and that we are the one-stop shop uh, for that information. If ever that is shaken, it's not one area of work uh, that is questioned. It is everything that we do as a health organization that is questioned. And that has a huge trickle-down effect. Uh, so false uh, allegations about things for us, uh, any challenges to even our processes, uh, we keep a very close eye on from a communications point of view. Now, the way we approach communications, uh, we have many different platforms, but the concept is the same for our platforms. Uh, we on the y-axis here because we do these things. Uh, you're going to be looking at basically the emotion, uh, the perception that the public has about an issue. Are they panicked about an issue? Are they outraged? Or do they really not care? Uh, that's something that we're going to look at. We also then on the x-axis, look at the hazard as defined by our experts. What do our experts tell us about this issue? Is it uh, something that should be concerning for us? Where you see small hazard and appropriate uh, emotional engagement, you see health education there, you see high emotion on the right uh, quadrant, you see we have crisis communications there, that's when the hazard's going to be high, and that's when the emotion is going to be high. There are times these levels are inappropriate. There are times there is not a major hazard, but people are very concerned. We will use our communications to bring that concern down a bit, to get it into the appropriate level. There are times that the uh, hazard is low, I'm sorry, the hazard is high, and the emotion is lower than it needs to be. We need people to care about something. We need people to take certain actions. We will work with our different communications tool to raise that. Let me give you a few examples of how we do this. Uh, the first one, this is the upper left, uh, the outrage management. Uh, this is when the, the issue is not a real or major issue, and however, people are very worked up over this. Uh, this is a situation that came in through our social media. Uh, it came in in Russian first, uh, and it was concerned that WHO had said veganism or vegetarianism is a mental illness. Now, we watch these things for a little bit. We don't necessarily respond to every single thing that's out there. That would be physically impossible. But we do watch to see if things start to spread, if things start to get what we call to get legs. Uh, this particular one started to. Uh, so our social media team here started working uh, to actually educate uh, a bit, to put some information out there that raw food eating, vegetarian, vegan diet are not related to any kind of mental disorder. It took a few uh, few days, and then you see the Voice of Russia uh, put out uh, a headline addressing it. So we do find that social media is a very good way uh, to get the, the emotion where we need it to be. Uh, and, and a lot of times, if you can contain things on social media, 
it gets uh, it gets taken care of there, and it never spills over to traditional media. So it's it's a nice way to be able to uh, build relationships with people to take care of things. Now, if you look at the health education uh, quadrant on the bottom left there, uh, one thing we did with that was the International Ear and Hearing Care Day. Uh, this was something that it's not a, a WHA mandated day. It's not a big day, but uh, we figured hearing issues affect a lot of people. Uh, on this particular one, WHO tweeted out 12 facts on ear and hearing care, and it generated over 100 personal stories within 12 hours. Uh, this is the beauty of social media. You can connect with real people. Uh, you can get people recognizing that there are very, uh, there are a lot of people uh, that struggle with the same issue they do. And that really is an important process in getting people to take the health actions you need or to norm an issue. Uh, to make people recognize that the problems they struggle with, many people do. Uh, and that's very important uh, for people to understand. Next one, let's look at precautionary advocacy. So World Mental Health Day, this is something that is uh, a very important issue for us as an organization. Uh, and yet it doesn't always uh, get a lot of attention. Increasingly it is growing. Uh, but we like to do a lot with it because the public love it. Uh, the public really connect to this issue because it affects so many people. Uh, so here you see our social media team went out with, have you ever experienced depression? How do you cope with it? What was helpful to you? Share your stories. And this is about getting people to share their stories. And you find throughout the conversation, different people add different things that are important to them, how they've handled different issues. And then at the very end there, you see WHO, I'm enjoying your little thoughts on depression. I've been in a bad way lately, and it's always nice to know someone understands. It's the emotion that Titi was mentioning. Uh, the emotion is everything in communications. It really helps people understand. The last one, crisis communications. Uh, the disease, disease outbreak will fall into this issue. Uh, and a lot of what we look for in crisis communications uh, is making sure that we are being transparent, making sure we are being fast, recognizing that we do not know everything. It is okay not to know everything. But getting out there with the information that we know, saying what we don't know, and saying what we are doing to find out what we don't know. That's what people want. That's what people want to know when there is uncertainty. A lot of our reputational issues will fall in here, but it really helps uh, work the emotional scale if you are telling them what you know and uh, what we're working to find out. We also do uh, public relations, of course, and customer service. And, and, and really, uh, that personal connection can contain so much uh, and build so many bridges uh, in communications. Uh, this is regular, just having normal exchanges of conversation like you would as a, as a real person. Somebody's coming to us and looking for information for, for blood donors, and we can easily direct them to the place on our website uh, where they can find that information. Uh, it's people raising issues that could grow to be a reputational issue that could spread to traditional media uh, to uh, be outraged about something. But if we can have a simple uh, exchange with them, uh, then we can often take care of it very quickly because they're human beings and we're just having a normal exchange of a conversation here and that's, that's all people really want. It's the communications trends that have really changed uh, the way that we communicate health information. Uh, a decade ago, even, even when I was uh, deep in the heart of media, uh, it was very top down. Uh, I covered medical news for CNN for 15 years and, and, and for, uh, I would say, the first 10 of that, People blindly accepted. If I went out with health information uh, and said, this expert says this, it was accepted. It was rarely challenged and questioned. Uh, the media would then take the information, package it up that nicely, and present it in one-way conversation to the public. Uh, today, it's very different. Today, it is very multi-directional. It is often audience-driven. The media listen to the audience. The media participate in social media to find out what people want to talk about. And the, the conversations are very different. Uh, where it used to be, by the time it was put in the public, 
it was accurate, it was polished, everything was proper. Uh, now it's much more the way we function on daily life. When we go to a dinner party, we may raise an issue that, oh, I read this article uh, about this particular topic, and it really surprised me I thought this. Somebody else will come into the conversation and say, oh, that disagrees completely with what I read a month ago in a different publication. And it will start a conversation around the table where we form our opinions by discussing and debating with our friends. And that's the way that public opinion is formed today, and that's the way that media works today. Uh, it's a much different approach. It does not have to be accurate. It does not have to be objective. But it is the essential reason that we are on social media, because if people are throwing inaccurate, incomplete uh, thoughts out onto social media, especially about health or about WHO, we need to engage in the conversation. Uh, because if we don't do that, uh, then it could be assumed that we are fine with it and that it is accurate. People rely on us now to participate in the debate, to participate in the conversation. Uh, and Monica and Sari and Gregory uh, do that for us on a regular basis. Uh, so we've covered the second line there. Traditional media was the way it really was, accuracy first. And now it's, it's digital media and it evolves in real time. And we cannot be bothered when things are inaccurate first. Our job is to help them uh, shape the conversation to get them accurate. Uh, the third uh, section down there, it used to be very deliberate when we talked about things. It was very well planned out. Uh, it was very much orchestrated to happen in a certain way. Uh, today, it's constant conversation. Uh, our social media team never takes a day off. Uh, you can't step away from it. If you step away from it, the conversation could go in a place that you may not be able to pull it back from if it's inaccurate. And uh, the bottom there, Peer opinion today is much more important than expert opinion. We don't necessarily, with the public, get exactly what we want just because we say WHO says this. Uh, your friends, uh, the peers in your communities, uh, your digital communities, your social networks, have much more influence on what you think. And that's why we often work to uh, get third-party champions in other places. Things can be far more powerful if they come from influential people than from just us. So this is our social media presence. We spend a lot of time on this. Uh, if you guys all get out on your social networks, you can get us to over a million on Twitter, and we would appreciate that uh, because we are hovering close. Uh, but this really is our front line of communications now. We still work with traditional media. All of that still stands. We just have to give uh, a lot of time to this now. And it's, it's actually a wonderful way uh, to share health information. We have health experts that have their networks on here. We have general public that have their networks on here. Uh, it's many different types of people that follow us. But this is where the real-time communication happens now. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show you uh, was how we adapt uh, for these communications trends. Uh, you may be familiar with our product, Disease Outbreak News. Uh, it is generally uh, the first product that we put out uh, for the website when there is a notification of a development with a disease outbreak. We always notify the member states first. But after that, we always used to write the disease outbreak news uh, and put that on our website. After that, we would take those pieces of information to social media. Uh, with H7N9 this year, uh, we began to get criticism because it was taking too long. Now, to be noted, our timeline didn't shift. The world's timeline did. We live in a real-time world now. Uh, so we begin to recognize that we are WHO, and we will not sacrifice accuracy for anything. So we cannot rush certain approval processes. We sacrifice accuracy. We hurt our reputation. People will not take our health information. So we decided, it's Twitter. We can always get 140 characters out. And so we decided at this point, this was last April, uh, we decided that at that point, the first place we would notify the public of disease outbreak updates would be on Twitter. And that more in-depth information would follow on the website as we got that information cleared. The public loved it, the journalists loved it, the health workers loved it, uh, because it let us show that we were still relevant, that we were still timely, and that we were still communicating information. 
Uh, moving forward, uh, I think that covers the fact that we are really working uh, with the public more and more these days, uh, that we're trying to get them the knowledge that they need to take into their communities. Uh, and really, we're working on uh, a communication strategy now. Uh, and it's going to be a global one, and it's the first time we've done a global communication strategy uh, that fits in to what every region, every country, every technical area is doing to impact health. Uh, but we're trying to find consistent ways to explain what it is we do. I mean, I was just rattling off norm standards and guidelines, and now that we're working more with the general public, that kind of makes them glaze over because they don't quite know what that means. We have to figure out how to explain this more uh, for the general public. Uh, again, we will continue to raise the visibility of the work because that's how we improve health. If we get our information out there, people can take the actions they need to be healthy, but in order to do all of this, we must protect uh, the processes and the reputation of this organization. But one of the things that is rising uh, very consistently through all the consultations that we're doing with this strategy, and we've been going to many different uh, areas and regions and talking to many different people, there's one thing that continues to rise uh, to the point that we're taking it in now, uh, and that is we need to work with young people even more. And there's two different endpoints for the young people. Uh, some of the regions want to work with young people to get on the front end of health trends, to try to change certain behaviors that are a trend in their particular region or in certain countries, to try to get them to adapt uh, healthier uh, behaviors earlier. The other channel is we need to work more with the next generation of policymakers and the next generation of public health workers. And so that will be working more with the university students, whether it's political science students and their professors, or health students, public health students, uh, medical students, and their professors, so that we have that relationship. Because as Fifty said, it's all about that personal connection now. Uh, we have the relationship uh, before they're actually in their full career. That's all I have at this point. I'll turn it over to him. Uh, okay, well, we've had two superb presentations, and I'm sure um, we've got a lot of questions coming. I've already noted that we've got quite a few questions on Twitter, and we probably have questions in the room and questions on other media. I'm now going to hand it over to uh, our newly designated head of our WHO Collaborating Center, Professor Sanjoy Bhattacharya, who will moderate the, the question period. Thank you. Uh, two fantastic talks, and what a privilege to end the year on such a high. Um, I'd just quickly like to thank all WHO colleagues uh, for their support. I mean, the, my colleagues at the University of York and I are deeply honored uh, that uh, to have the WHO Collaborating Center uh, for Global Health Histories. Um, uh, the Wellcome Trust has been funding our joint activities since 2008, and we're deeply grateful to them as well. And they've, in fact, given us funding for the long term. So a lot of exciting stuff is planned uh, for the coming years. So you'll have to tolerate me for at least four more years. I'll be visiting regularly. Um, if I could remind you that we have um, colleagues online listening to today's event. So when you make comments or ask questions, could you please identify yourself? Because that's very useful for colleagues who are not in this room. But because we've experimented today, thanks to Christie's department, with questions from Twitter, I think I should uh, start with some questions you've already received through the WHO's Twitter feed. Um, there are quite a few, so I'll intersperse them between uh, questions that we have from the room itself, but we have uh, a question from the Suicide Prevention NGO in New Zealand, which asks, why promote Prosper Consortium when finance interests of those involved are tied up to pharma, through consultancy, data sales, etc.? A question for both speakers, I suppose. And there is another question from Michael Rosanoff, Associate Director of Public Health Research in New York, asking, 
Scientific impact is a function of dissemination. What is the WHO role in communicating science? Best practice? Or meta-analysis? So again, I think the question is directed at both speakers. So after, uh, perhaps, you know, have a think uh, about these questions while I invite other colleagues in the room to ask their own questions. So please, questions, comments. Coleman. Now I'm, I'm going to ask a question from traditional social media because I have a few questions about email. <laughs> <laughs> which is also, I don't forget that. Um, so, can you use the mic, please? Yeah, okay. um, yeah so I'm, I'm asking a question on behalf of the head of our uh, service delivery unit, Ed Kelly, who is using traditional social media, i.e., email, and uh, the question he's asking is, um, let me get it. Not being here, I'm reluctant to weigh in with the question, but I, one I would ask is if, if there would be issues of provider, patient, family communication are so important to appropriate effective care, yet it is regularly the area rated the lowest in terms of performance assessment, in quality studies, and rarely do WHO guidelines include elements of appropriate effective communication. How could WHO do better in improving communication in healthcare settings? What tools do we have and what areas should be priority? Yeah, big I'm just happy to take the first step. I'm not familiar with the PROSPER consortium, so I'm, I'm going to have to uh, gracefully uh, avoid details on that particular one, but I think you, you might be able to add some to that, Human. What I will say, though, is the, 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 the root of the question that they are asking is something that's very important to us. Uh, conflict of interest not saying that this is, but the recognition, the perception of conflict of interest uh, is something that WHO takes very seriously. Uh, and it is the reason that uh, we have very stringent uh, guidelines for that within the organization for any of our expert advisory committees. Uh, I don't know the details of this particular case, but it's a, it's a, a question that's common to us, not from uh, PROSPER, uh, but from many of our uh, expert advisory committees, whether it's putting out recommendations for SALT, uh, or whether it's advising on how to uh, approach certain vaccinations. Uh, it is something that we often get questions on. Uh, where does the money come from? Is there undue industry influence on this? So from a reputation management point of view, the question doesn't surprise me. We get many of them. Uh, but this organization takes this very seriously and has a very proactive approach to it. I'll let you two talk about the details of Prosper itself, since you're more familiar with it. I'm, I'm not sure if everybody knows what Prospero is, but it's um, a database at the University of York on which you can register your protocol, and that might be a research protocol, or it, I mean, it can be any sort of research, it's not necessarily for RCTs, randomised control trials, it might also be for a systematic literature review. Um, the question was about can we read that question yeah. again? The, the first part of the sentence is important. Why promote Prosper Consortium when finance interests of those involved are tied to pharma through consultancy, data sales, etc.? So is that just the Prospero Consortium or is that the people who are actually registering? Because certainly not all research is funded by pharma. So, yeah. Mainly the National Institute of Health Research, which is the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's the difference? I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, WHO is not involved in this at all. It's uh, it's run by the University of York, mainly financed by 
the National Health Service. Um, certainly, WHO supports the objectives, which is to register um, any systematic review beforehand, and this is so that we avoid bias mm. in, in the published literature, and that's a noble objective which WHO wants, you know, so to avoid underreporting of negative results. Um, but WHO is not involved in the management of this. Uh, I'm sure that if there are, if, if there is some um, funding, I'm sure the University of York and National has mechanisms for managing those conflicts of interest. And I think if if whoever's asking the question has doubts about that, they should um, formulate, you know, raise their concerns with University of York or National Health Service, who are the main funders. Um, but, but the objectives of the WHO, well, WHO is not involved in the management of that. If that's a prospect that they're referring to, there may be another possible question. The second question was, scientific impact, what is WHO's role in communicating science? Is it best practice? Uh, there's a broad range uh, of ways we work with scientific information. Uh, there are expert advisory groups that sit down and look at all the latest research that's done on one thing, and from that they come up with what they determine to be best practices in certain areas or recommendations of certain actions uh, that they think. Uh, rarely do we look at one study and take a decision because of one study. Uh, so for us, it's much more uh, looking at the broader picture and, and, and what continual research is shown. Uh, number three, uh, definitely, uh, you provide uh, patient communications, uh, if it's so important, what is WHO doing to do it better? Uh, this is an area that's very interesting to us, uh, and I know that the person who asked the question uh, is actually uh, working on a, I think, first ever project with us where we're actually looking into this, where we're actually looking into communications through health workers and how do you improve that, whether it's from a handover uh, between shifts, whether it's when a patient's checking out of a hospital and you give specific information to the patient uh, to try to reduce the chance that they'll come back to the hospital. I think there's an era now where we're recognizing that that type of communications is very important for improving health. Uh, and I think it, it was Ed that sent that in, right, Ed Kelly? Yeah, yeah I, I think Ed is on the front end of a conversation about this type of work, but it, it is quite intriguing, uh, especially for his area of work, uh, where you're looking at how to uh, improve quality of care for patients. Miriam, there's a question. To ask your question. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in how we go in the future and how we do engage with private enterprise because one of the things I was struck by in your presentation was, you know, we're dealing with people living their normal lives and the vast majority of people work for private enterprise and that's what they do. So going forwards, how do we how do we engage? I'm, I'm just very struck, particularly an example I'm familiar with in the United Kingdom where when we had a, a lot of scares and discussion around genetically modified foods, the group which was uh, probably the most galvanized in providing information and data were the, were the supermarkets. And they were providing actually quite good scientifically balanced, you know, information, I mean, and those types of things. So I'm just wondering, you know, I understand, you know, a strong conflict of interest policy is good, but I'm wondering how much longer we can just keep things at arm's length and how, whether there's any ideas about appropriate engagement with private enterprise, particularly with, as the speed of communication and the majority of messages are going to be going through those types of channels. I think as an organization, we're already recognizing that we're past the point that it's them versus us. Uh, I think uh, all aspects of life uh, today are interwoven. Where we have to guard is the policy making pieces. Uh, the policy making pieces that you can protect, the recommendations that we give out to improve health to make sure that uh, they're not unduly influenced, to make sure that the sugar industry uh, isn't feeding in when we're trying to tell people uh, what level of sugar is okay and where is it going to uh, uh, be troublesome. Uh, that's really uh, what the organization is working with now, and we're having active meetings on this now. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had the uh, consultation with non state actors. 
uh, to try to uh, get this conversation going because I think the organization does recognize it, and it's not uh, an all or nothing uh, option either, uh, especially when you're looking at non communicable uh, diseases. How are you going to move this forward without working with the food industry? This is what we struggle with, uh, but it's it's really a balance we have to strike. You know, you don't want to do something that's going to jeopardize being seen as the trusted source for health information, and yet at the same time, uh, you need to be able to accomplish what you need to with reaching real people and making the changes that you need to make. Uh, already, uh, there are certain times that we've got pharmaceutical industry at the table. We can't do a lot of our work without that. Uh, we have to have their input on and guidance on certain things. It's really up to the organization to figure out how we take this forward safely. Uh, and that's really the middle of the consultation that they're in. So I think everybody does share uh, your interest in doing it. When it comes to using uh, private industry to pass out information, you already see a wide variety of that. Uh, where we watch closely with that uh, is the use of our logo. Uh, to suggest whether or not we are a, a true partner or not, because that's that's the tricky piece. A lot of it is perception. Uh, a lot of it is the perception uh, that WHO is being unduly influenced uh, in certain areas. Uh, perception is often the currency that we deal with in communications, because it, it is more powerful than back sometimes. Uh, so no, it's a hot topic right now for the organization, and there's decent consultation on it. So hopefully we'll. Uh, I'll have an answer to that difficult question soon. Do you want to add anything? Just to add that the question was from Rob Terry, who's now in tropical disease research. We have a question uh, from an online participation from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, it's uh, it's from uh, Deborah Miranda, who works for a malaria research consortium um, that only towards the end of its lifetime decided to invest in communication. I would like to ask Christy, how do, we, how do you think we can create a culture within the research community to allocate part of their grounds to communications activities from the very early stages of research? Deborah, I think there's many people in communications that uh, uh, share your frustration on that. It's not unusual. Uh, the uh, consortium that you're working with there, that you, that you did some work with there, uh, their approach to investing in communications or not realizing the power of communications until late in the uh, game is, is actually quite common. Uh, and I think a lot of that is up to us. Uh, as communicators, we need to show the return on the investment in communications. We need to show uh, that communications actually is a useful tool, uh, a technical expertise, and can make a difference. Uh, so I, I answer that actually by putting it back on us. If we do our jobs well uh, and show the return on the investment in communications, then I think we will see the shift uh, on the front end. Well. Another question from our uh, online participation. What tips are there for the development of pictorial warnings against tobacco use, taking into account the many languages, cultures, and low literacy and low health literacy levels existing in Africa? And this is from Dayan Swart, National Council Against Smoking. The speakers are discussing. <laughs> I'll start, and then uh, Peter will, will jump in here. Uh, as far as the pictorial warnings against tobacco, I can't necessarily comment on that particular piece, because there's usually quite uh, specific parameters around that for different places, depending. Uh, on what is where, or I would call in my tobacco people to help us with that. Uh, what I can talk to, let's see, the development of tutorial use, taking into account many languages, cultures, and low literacy. Uh, I think the number one thing any communications person would advise on that uh, is making sure it connects uh, to the audience that you're trying to hit. Uh, number one way for doing that is, is focus groups, bouncing off, off of the small group to see if it even has the impact that you need uh, and connects to 
uh, the community that you're trying to connect to. Um, you want to add to that? Yeah, I would agree with the focus groups um, angle, but also I think maybe it's you need to think about other methods and not just pictorial warnings on tobacco. Maybe um, there are other other ways of communicating this this information alongside that, because. I guess pictures cut across languages and cultures you need to take note of, but it might need a bit more explanation, particularly if it's in low literacy, low educational levels of Africa or anywhere else. So. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Christine and, uh, the, and colleagues for, for this very wonderful presentation. It's very rich in content. And um, sorry, I was going to go to that. Uh, my name is David. I'm from the Singapore Mission. So um, my, my question really is, is about how do you utilize social media to gain even greater market share for WHO? So uh, let me elaborate on this because um, in, in, in my opinion, one of the greatest assets for WHO lies in the DG because we have seen how firsthand how charismatic she is, and you know even the most hardened of diplomats will sway to her views because she's very good at persuading people and clarifying things. So, is there um, uh, uh, any plans for her to to utilize her by having her write opinion pieces on blogs on WHO blogs or anything rather than through um, scientific journals, which I saw that she's doing, but but only certain people read the scientific journals how about blogs or, or any just kind of personal comments on a particular issue. Thank you. So I actually do once in a while. Uh, th there's been several places that she's invited, been invited to guest blog, uh, and there's been several places that we've done uh, specific uh, interview type formats with her. Uh, so we do it some. Uh, you're right, we probably could do it more. Uh, but we, it, it does resonate well when we use it uh, for a specific, for a specific goal, and, and, and we actually look at what we're trying to accomplish with that audience. Yeah, it's quite useful. Well, thank you, Chrissy. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, my name is Regina Ongirare. I coordinate a program called e Portuguese, which is the I mean, is uh, directed to the Portuguese-speaking countries. They are among the least developed in the world. And just I'd like to complement something that was asked for the, you know, that uh, other person that had asked, uh, uh, that, uh, there was a question on the screen here. And it is about how to communicate when there are low literacy and they have to be uh, cultural sensitive. And this is an example from the Portuguese-speaking countries because they are in Africa among the least developed in the world. And they have the only five who speak Portuguese in Africa, so they are again left behind. So what they created among themselves is a theater, um, moving theater that goes from country to country, uh, providing uh, different, uh, let's say, plays. But I mean, simple ones, uh, um, informing what they wanted to 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 take to the people, uh, like. Uh, pregnancy, teenage pregnancy, uh, breastfeeding, and many, many others. And this has now a competition between all those theaters. And they have, they go all over the place. The last, last year was in Brazil. There was in the very northeast of Brazil. There are a competition of those health theaters, which is a very interesting thing. And you gave the example of Guatemala. Wasn't it Guatemala? Yeah. So those are the things that local people can use to disseminate and to, and to communicate. And they work with, uh, of course, health uh, educators or some NGOs that are on the field. And this is a very powerful thing because, the, I mean, just as, um, I mean, how many, there are more than 3,000 languages in Africa, and you can't communicate only in English, Portuguese, and, and, and French. You have to communicate in local languages because, as they, he said, I mean, people are illiterate, so they need the communication, how they can relate to that. And the other thing that in Brazil was very, I mean, it was very used many, many years ago was the buses. They're open like that, and they go from village to village and to place to place 
playing around with things that they wanted to disseminate at that time was, uh, I know, culture, etc. But they do that also with the health message. And I think in local, very low uh, income countries, this is a very powerful thing. And where they do. And the radio, and that's the other thing because they don't have phones and they don't have uh, you know smartphones or anything, but they or electricity, but they don't have they have radios. And those are other things that we you work with them in this kind of stuff, just to complement a little bit too. To, thank you. I had a few more questions from Twitter, which are very interesting. One is from Malaika, a public health educator in Brooklyn. And again, it's a related question, and she says there is still a large amount of health illiteracy. How do WHO plan to address this? Then uh, we have a question um, from the in International Agency for, for Communications, uh, Manager for Prevention of Blindness, Hyderabad, India, can we expect the best practice guidelines for health communication so that health campaigns around the world can benefit? And I'm assuming this is in response to Deepthi's references uh, to that wonderful uh, sort of public engagement project in Bangladesh. Um, so would you like to comment? Or? I don't know. Oh. If there are any guidelines, that, I'm sure there must be guidelines that have been written. Um, if not, then perhaps that's something to look at together. <laughs> but yes, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer to that one as to whether you can expect guidelines or not. But there's, there should be some somewhere. I can certainly do some research if you wish to have some. Yes, so we get in touch with this through email. And regarding the question about uh, health literacy, uh, how do we work uh, to address it? Uh, I think uh, a lot of our work goes uh, to work towards this. A lot of this through many different platforms and many different channels. Uh, I agree that there is a huge issue with this. Uh, and it is a huge responsibility for us to move towards this. Uh, the different platforms that we work through, the different products that we do, um, you know, they they strive uh, to address it. But at the same time, we're, we're constantly uh, trying to reach out and listen, uh, listen to uh, the public, listen to the audiences that we talk to, uh, to see how we can do this better. Uh, really, it is such a two-way conversation right now. Where we see questions asked in certain ways, it does give us insight on where we need to do more and, and what types of products uh, and information uh, we can do. But it's very much a, a, a two-way street on that. Um, huge issue. The, the, the information, the platforms we have today are much better to address it uh, than it used to be. We have a very interesting question for Christy on Twitter. Uh, from Miriam Yasser, from, uh, who's based in Melbourne, what strategies are employed by WHO Communications when criticism against WHO research is published in scientific journals, example, The Lancet? Something we deal with periodically, so we do have a strategy for that. Uh, on every, I mean, an organization this large that does this much work, you're going to get criticism. So you can't be stunned when criticism uh, appears in certain places. And, and let's even take it beyond the scientific journals uh, and take it to uh, different newspapers, different comments in the media. Let's take it to social media. Uh, when people attack us, what do we do? The number one thing we look for is to see if it's true. Is it factually based? Uh, if it is uh, a mistake, if it is factually inaccurate, how do we determine if we address it? Uh, the number one thing we look for it is how influential uh, is the publication or is the person that sent it? Uh, if it is a blog, how many people follow this blog? Who are they that follow this blog? Uh, if it's a journal like Lancet, uh, we often reach out directly uh, to Lancet and have, a, have an exchange of conversation on what was the source of this information and things like this. But the scientific community is an area we're much more comfortable in. When it comes to blogs and uh, other uh, media outlets that we don't know personally, uh, it's a very different story. You have to find out, is it worth addressing this? If we address every single criticism that we got on uh, a media platform of any type, 
we would only be doing that all day long. Uh, so we look at uh, who is saying it, how influential are they, what is the chance that this inaccuracy uh, could start spreading uh, and be accepted as fact. That's a major thing. If it is a high risk, we must hit it head on. Uh, we must address it. If it's something that will uh, damage our reputation and increase the likelihood that people won't trust our health advice, well, then it's a major thing we need to address. If it's something that only is, is one person that doesn't seem to have an influential following, we may not always address it. Uh, it's really that is the strategy that we look for. If it's something in a scientific journal, let's just take that exercise through for a moment, uh, it is obviously something that affects a very important uh, audience for us. Uh, so chances are uh, we will address in some way, shape, or form after we have a con conversation directly uh, with the journal itself to find out what was the background behind it. Often if, if something is going to be published in something like that, uh, we do know uh, a little bit in advance. Uh, because it is such a professional relationship. I mean, this is uh, all one area of work. Uh, so a lot of different things that go into that strategy, but that just gives you an overview. We have a question from an online participant, uh, Satyajit Sarkar. Uh, great presentation, he says. Thanks. A reflection. Yes. The WHO is in the business of norms and standards, but should this also, not, uh, should not this also include areas beyond the biomedical example, health communication? I know the WHO is doing some solid stuff on M health norms. Um, WHO works on strengthening health systems as a key strategy, but this involves very, very little work with health communication promotion systems. Should this not change? We hope that it doesn't. Uh... Uh, I, I hope that your last sentence uh, is not completely true. Uh, we do like to think that uh, we do communications to try to strengthen uh, health systems a bit. I take your point, we could do more. Uh, the uh, M health piece, I'm going to look at Huma here and see if he makes any body language movement that he might take this up <laughs> because the M health work does come under his, uh, his department, not mine. Um, as far as guidelines or norms uh, for health communications, I know we have done some guidance uh, for disease outbreak, uh, communicating in disease outbreak or emergencies. Uh, we have not built uh, a broader uh, uh, guidance for uh, communications that I'm aware of. I'm trying to catch the eye of somebody who's been here longer than me, but I don't see him. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that, that that there is interest for this. Maybe it is something we yeah, work together on. Would you like to talk about M Health at all, my friend? Uh, <laughs> M Health in the department is not my particular area, but certainly uh, WHO works with many partners uh, in the E Health and M Health field, and uh, we're in fact hosting a, a, a meeting next month um, on this topic. Um, and yes, we are working on, on creating norms for health communication through mobile platforms. Oh, two more questions from <laughs> two, two more questions from Twitter. The first is from AdLife Project, a grassroots organization for global health. It says, how can we get more grassroots support to persuade governments to invest? in the prevention of non-communicable diseases. And the second question is from an NGO on anti-leprosy based in London. How does communicate need for guidelines to get genuine participation of persons affected by neglected tropical diseases? Um, the second one uh, is from an NGO on anti-leprosy in London. It asks, how best communicate need for guidelines to get genuine participation of persons affected by neglected tropical diseases, so I suppose patient participation in health communications? I mean, I, it, with, within WHO, we have the 
uh, guideline review um, committee and the secretariat, and uh, we have a handbook of, of best practices for creating guidelines. And certainly, uh, part of that is for the the working group who develops the guideline always to have representatives of the groups that that guideline will affect. And if it's uh, patients, especially if for that disease there is a patient association or something, um, the guideline development group is supposed to reach out uh, and get participation of them in development of the guidelines. And there is a there's a question from an online participant, um, uh, Adura Benny Banketanis, who asked, "Would you, or do you think, what do you think may be the potential value of using innovative tools such as social return on investment methodology in the area of maternal health?" I think there's a lack of clarity about what social return means amongst the speakers, so perhaps an email conversation might be, be better. But we have another question for Deepthi from Twitter. It's from uh, the Global Atlas of Worm Infection, again based in London. And it asks, how has the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine uh, based ideas project used local and international media as part of their health communications? Is there a need to train journalists? Right. Well, ideas is a little bit complicated because we're evaluating other Gates projects. Well, we're not evaluating the projects. We're evaluating the innovations. But the innovations are being implemented by other projects that are being funded by Gates. So it's not ideas directly. Um, and those projects are local to the area in which they're working. Some of them have um, good media contacts and some of them are working to build up their media contacts. But that's, yes, there is a need for some journalist education sometimes, but not maybe in all areas. Um, and I think that's probably about as much as I can say about that. I hope that's comprehensive enough. If you want more information, then let me know. We also have a question from the UN office. Ah, another question uh, from an online participant, uh, Mary uh, Mansula, uh, biomedical sciences student at Monash University, Australia. Uh, the question is, what has been done to bridge the age gap to ensure that the younger generation in Western society is become aware and educated about the highly sensitive and damaging health issues that are so prevalent in third world countries? What can be done to inspire the next generation and motivate them to become involved with organizations such as the WHO? That is the exact question that I am looking to discuss next week. Uh, how do we uh, bridge this gap more than we do today? So uh, if you have ideas for that, I would welcome uh, some more information on that. Uh, but it is, it, it's with the development of this uh, global communication strategy where we're uh, trying to uh, understand how we can connect better to younger generations. Uh, this is uh, where we are still uh, on a work in progress. Uh, how do we reach out? How do we connect? What issues are interesting? Uh, what are uh, the strengths each bring? How can we work best uh, to connect there? So it would be very interesting in fleshing out that discussion with you. And a very, very big question uh, through Twitter again, and this is from the UN Information Center in Beirut. What are the main communication challenges the WHO is facing in polio endemic countries? I can report that the one speaker is smiling, and the other speaker is looking very worried. And <laughs> Uh, I think uh, there are a multitude uh, of challenges. Uh, this is Christy. Uh, I think there's uh, a multitude of challenges there, and I think it really shows uh, in some of these countries the importance of being able to connect locally. 
uh, that this is uh, much more than just uh, trying to get out uh, and give polio vaccine. This is really trying to convince communities, trying to convince cultures uh, that this is a good thing to do. Uh, when it comes to uh, the progress that we have made uh, in immunizing against uh, polio, uh, where it is left uh, is endemically uh, is three countries where they are very uh, specific and it's not one size fits all. Uh, and I think even uh, with uh, polio, uh, but much broader than polio, when you're looking for people to take certain health actions, you have to convince them uh, that it is safe. You have to convince them that it is in their best interest. Uh, and the only way you do that is by building trust. Uh, and that's why uh, working with uh, the local community uh, leaders, working with the change agents, working with the people who understand the culture is so critical uh, because it's not about uh, health experts coming in. It's about people, their trust, uh, telling them the right thing to do. So really getting connected and building that trust on a local level is everything. There are more questions on the floor. I'd, I'd like to thank our speakers So, two fantastic presentations. and. As I said, this brings to a close the GHH seminar program for 2013. But I'm happy to report on behalf of Women and myself that we have a year-long program on the history of universal health care planned uh, for next year, uh, of which 10, about 10 will be held at headquarters. And we're working with regional offices to have regional case studies uh, of their historical and contemporary experiences of universal healthcare as well. I thank you for joining us today. I know all of you are very busy. Uh, we hope to see you next year as well. And if you could just thank the speakers uh, for their participation. Thank you.